news today. Doug Peterson telling the media today. John McMullen was there. Tweet it out. <laughs> Tweet this out. <laughs> Ronald Darby, torn ACL, John. His season, and most likely his Eagles career, is now over. Uh, is this the, the the last you know straw for this defense uh, to lose Darby moving forward now? Uh, is this the last straw for not only this defense but this team moving forward uh, that the injuries are just too much piled up for them to be able to move on from? Yeah, I think it's it's pretty devastating. Uh, I mean, I think people are finally starting to realize that uh, while Ronald Darby and Jalen Mills aren't the greatest cornerbacks in the world, they're the best cornerbacks on this team by a wide, wide margin. And uh, now you don't have them both. Obviously, Ronald's going to be back out for the season. Uh, Jalen Mills probably still not going to be back this week. Uh, he'll be back at some point. But if you look at what the Eagles were throwing out there at cornerback in the fourth quarter and people are wondering why they struggled, I wonder why you wonder why they're struggling. <laughs> Certainly had their issues uh, last night in that area. Um, let, let's go back to the beginning, though. First half, they scored three points. Uh, Carson Wentz, I mean, I, I look at the game and say, if Carson Wentz, I, I, look, I get it, defense didn't play great, uh, a lot of other issues. But the quarterback stirs the drink in this league. If the quarterback plays better, they probably win the game. Yeah, Carson was really, uh, I don't want to say bad, but he, he was probably the worst he looked all season early in this game as far as accuracy at least. Uh, just didn't have it out of the box. And, you know, Doug talked about going tempo, uh, and that's the reason Golden Tate didn't play as much. And, by the way, that is egregious. I think if there's anything you point to at this game, and I'll explain it why a little bit later, the fact that Golden Tate was only on the field for 29% of the plays, the, the coaching staff should be ashamed of themselves. Uh, but he he was just didn't have it early. And uh, sometimes when that happens, tempo seems to help them. But I see the Eagles using that as a crutch far too much. Uh, I mean, this is not Chip Kelly. This is not where we want to run tempo consistently. Yeah. This is one you want to play smart football and there's no question, Carson's got to play better. John, I think one of the under-discussed storylines of the year has been, in my, in my feeling, is that Jordan Hicks and Nigel Bradham, who you thought going into this year were going to be that rock of the middle of your defense, have made zero impact plays on this team. I mean, zero. They, they Especially Bradham, who seemed to make every big third down play last year, and then after Jordan went out, he took on an even bigger role. Uh, just in general, these linebackers on this team, and I'll, I'll even, you know, Grugier Hill doesn't pick off a pass that he should get. Nate Gary is lost on uh, the Zeke Elliott one-yard touchdown. They, they're just not giving this team anything. Yeah, I mean, I think Jordan is, is slowly getting back to where he was uh, coming off uh, the injury, and I, I think it's gotten better, not necessarily. I hear what you're saying as far as plays. I've talked to Mike about this a lot, about players having career years, and uh, they generally don't have them two years in a row. Nigel's in that category. I, I mean, Nigel had a career year, and he's probably just not that good of a player, and he's back to the mean. And I think that explains uh, his decline more than anything. And, and KGH, you know, he just had thumb surgery. I think that was a big part uh, of not being able to corral that. That would have impacted the game, I think, significantly because what we constantly talk about is this defense, they can't create turnovers. They had one right there. That would have been a pick six. That would have been huge, I, I think, for their psyche. Sometimes it's just, you know, the week he's got thumb surgery, <laughs> he gets that opportunity yep. sometimes fate is just uh, trending towards bad luck instead of good luck you know one interesting thing we talk a lot about this defense and how good they are how good they're not uh jim schwartz he seems to be public enemy number one out there is it fair all the criticism that schwartz is getting you're talking about how egregious it was for the offense not to get tate involved how about the games that schwartz is calling right now 
Well, I, I, I give Jim a little bit more of a rope simply because of what I just said, the cornerbacks uh, that were out there. I, I mean, I don't know what people expect him to do. Uh, I would like him to be more aggressive at times, but when you don't have guys that can cover on the outside, what do you do? You play more zone. I hear everybody complaining uh, about sort of that umbrella defense where defensive back stands at the sticks on third and 15 or whatever, uh, and, and guys are running towards them and they don't make the play. Well, you, you know, just because you start at the sticks, you're not taught to stay there. The whole point of that defense is you make them throw underneath and rally to the football. So, you know, I go back to before the Super Bowl, and I gave Doug Doug Peterson a lot of credit for, for his quote saying, look, this league is 98% talent, 2% coaching. And, I look, I think it's more than that. Uh, I think Doug was playing his role down. But I also think he's right. This is a talent-driven league, and this is an execution-based league. And if you're playing that umbrella defense, a lot of teams do it, and a lot of teams do it really effectively and don't give up third and 15. That's an execution problem. Uh, I would say yes, John, agree. When you see it fail you on more than one or two occasions, though, I feel like then then it becomes a philosophical issue, too. Uh, in this league, especially against in this matchup against Dallas, who cannot throw the ball deep, I'm not as worried about my outside corners in that situation. I, I My goal is to get pressure on Dak because he's so much more of a vulnerable quarterback when he's throwing on the run or even just when he's pressured a little bit. You saw last night he was overthrowing open guys left and right. And when you play everybody back like that and invite on third and 15, you know Dallas is going to throw a screen. Everybody in the world knows Dallas is going to throw a screen. Now, yes, the players have to execute it, but you didn't put... You didn't dictate any kind of pressure on the opponent. They throw the screen. They've got an amazing running back who can make people miss. He gets close enough. In this league, if you get 14 yards on that when you need 15, they're going to go for it on fourth and one. So my my issue is philosophically, he's so bent on protecting his weakness at corner that he forgets that there's a weakness on that on the, on the offensive side for Dallas as well. And I just he was pressuring Dak all night and. I think he gave Dak some opportunities that to capitalize, or the offense, I should say, that they shouldn't have had. Well, yeah, I mean, you can look at it both ways. I mean, the assumption is if Jalen Mills is in there, if Sidney Jones is in there, if Ronald Darby's in there and still healthy, uh, you're probably going to rally up and make that tackle. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you say Dallas can't throw the football down the field, he's probably – Probably right two weeks ago, Amari Cooper was pretty effective and probably should have had even more uh, if you think about the the long pass where he had Rasul Douglas beat. Probably would have been a long touchdown if Dak delivers the football. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, where I think Jim is being cautious and saying, my guys can't hold up uh, against Amari Cooper. I don't necessarily disagree with him. And that trends me back to my original point about Golden Tate. Mark Cooper played 85% of the plays in his first game with Dallas. He was at yep. 80% yesterday. Uh, Demarius Thomas, who was acquired that week, was on the field later in the same week. 79% of the snaps. I have offensive coaches off the record telling me on this team they need a playmaker. They got a playmaker, and they rented him who's got eight games left on his contract, and he's out there for 29% of the plays. The issue, if you want to look at coaching, I look at the offensive coaching, and I look at Frank Reich and John Filippo not being here and Mike Groh and Press Taylor being here. It's not the same. That, I think, is the biggest problem. John McMullen, uh, he writes right now at 97.3 ESPN.com, is there a silver lining to the Darby injury? If there is one, I'd like to hear it. Well, it is Sidney Jones going to the outside. That's where he should have been from day one. And the Eagles kind of pigeonholed in, in, into the slot because they needed a slot corner. He's not a slot corner. 
uh, obviously losing Patrick Robinson in free agency. So that was the natural place to get him on the field. But I think everybody who looked at Sidney Jones in the draft projected him as a top 15 talent, a potential lockdown corner. If he develops into that, hey, the Eagles win because they finally have a top-tier corner. Now, I'm not saying he's going to do that, but that's where he belongs. And when he does return to the lineup, and Sidney said he expects to be back this week, now you can put him on the outside. That, that to me, is a silver line. Can you imagine the reaction? People would struggle to come to grips with the idea that Sidney Jones on the outside, if he plays a really good game, you know, they plays really well, and they be, and he becomes the spark that kind of turns it around. People are going to be so excited about that and so angry about the fact that they're going to avoid <laughs> well, they, they thought he should have been out there in the first now, place. <laughs> the good news is I think this is long-term. I don't think he's having a good game next week. I agree. Uh, against, <laughs> against that offense and against Michael Thomas, uh, who might be the best receiver in football. Uh, but you know what? For all the Saints and for all the accolades we give them, and Michael Thomas is great, they don't have anything else a receiver. That's it. I mean, all their other playmakers are elsewhere, and obviously Kamara and Ingram out of the backfield. And you just mentioned, Jeff, the struggles, Nigel Bradham, Jordan Hanks. Well, it only gets worse this week because yeah. Kamara's one of the more difficult matchups in the entire league. Uh, what they do with Taysom Hill – uh, ben Watson is playing. He's 100 years old, and he's playing well. And, and <laughs> Drew Brees is 150, and he's playing even better. Uh, they're a great offense. But other than Michael Thomas, that's it at receiver. Right. They, don't, they don't have much else after Ted Ginn went down. Yeah, Brandon Marshall, they did sign today, by the way. Yeah, and to further yeah, your point, by the way, on Golden Tate compared to what Demarius Thomas and Amari Cooper uh, were able to do in their first games going forward – the Eagles gave up a third-round pick for an eight-game rental and literally just wasted game one of it. It's like yeah. they were acting like they had house money when, in opposite, they have the they have the, the opposite. And, 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 oh, by the way, Golden Tate is the one who's supposed to have the high football IQ. Right. Not Amari Cooper, not Demarius Thomas. Golden Tate's the smart guy. And they can't get him on the field? I, I think that was... An underreported, underrated. I, I was in shock how little he was in that game plan and how little he was on that field. Um, did he seem surprised? Well, I, I mean, what? No, I mean, Golden is a class act. I'm sure he was surprised, but he's not going to to say it outwardly or 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 be upset. But when you have an offense and other than fantasy football people who are probably thrilled at Zach Ertz, who set an NFL record for, for tight ends through nine games. And by the way, think about this, guys. Zach Ertz has caught more balls than any tight end in NFL history through 10 games. Mm -hmm. and he hasn't played his 10th game yet. <laughs> so he's it, playing it, with it, house money. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's 16 targets, 14 receptions. So you go, well, that's really uh, effective. Well, not necessarily. If you're, if you know, this offense is, is Zach Ertz all day, every play. That's what it is. Yeah, you missed and my fun I, stat. I, and the Eagles are every, 0 4 when he has 100 yards this year, and he has 100 yeah. yards four well, times. And then last night, Peterson says, I think we did a good job of spreading the ball around. One guy has yeah, 16 Mike and I were like, targets, what? 14 <laughs> catches. The next guy has five catches. I, I mean, and, and all Sean Jeffrey as well. It, it's, I, I've been saying this for a week. I'm the one who asked Carson, you know, you think about spreading the football around uh, a little bit more. And, look, if that's what the defense is giving you, it is effective. But in key situations, it's pretty obvious they know where the football is going. And when this offense was dominating last season, they were moving the football all over the place. And it were guys, you know, it was a different guy every week. And now it's not. And you, you bring in a playmaker for that exact reason because you needed another guy, and you don't use him. And you only have him, as Jeff and I mentioned, for eight games, now seven. You wasted one. So, I, I mean, maybe they, they work out an extension, uh, but we don't have that guarantee. This is the classic baseball-like rental 
So use the guy. Mm-hmm. It, it, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, I, I mean, it's not like they got him on Tuesday and he had to play Sunday. He had the entire bye week to, to kind of get an extra amount of time to go over things. So it even makes less sense that they weren't able to get him out. Now, today he said Josh Adams and Golden Tate have earned uh, – should expect more touches. It might be too little too late, but let's look at the running back situation. I know uh, the run game is always brought up, but – is it time to maybe say, look, we don't have enough in the passing game. They got to try to run the ball a little bit more. Well, no, because they have nobody who can run it. You know, I was joking. Uh, one of the reporters, and I, uh, I'll leave his name out of it, but he, he was. It, you, if you wave these three running backs today, would any of them get picked up on waivers? And I had to sit there and think, you know what? Probably not. Amazing, I, I isn't mean, it? Yeah. They don't have a, a, a running back, and, and it's different. Uh, look, I, I think Doug doesn't want a Le'Veon Bell type, doesn't want even a Shady McCoy type because that would force him to run the ball more than he wants. But I do think he would like a Jay Ajayi type, and that would have made a, a huge impact on this offense, and that injury hurts because he's a lot different than these other three guys. I, I think Josh Adams uh, of the options is certainly the best runner, certainly has that ability. But remember, you're talking about an undrafted kid. 32 teams had an opportunity to take him seven different times, and they all said, nope, no thanks. And part of that had to do with the foot injury, uh, and I think he's got draftable talent. And you could say the same thing about Corey Clement last year as an undrafted kid. We know Wendell Smallwood's limitations. There's not a lot of talent at running back in this organization. It's the clear weakness uh, on this roster. Well, that's exactly what I said to Mike in, uh, in the opening segment. I said, I'm not as upset with the run-pass ratio as people get to, tend to get. I get more you know, perturbed by the run productivity. And Andy Reid like to throw the – we all know he throws the ball more than anyone in the history in the league. But go back and look from – to Staley, to Brian Westbrook, to Shady McCoy, to Jamal Charles, and now to Kareem Hunt. He's always prioritized having a running back who can give you big plays in both the running game and as a receiver. And Doug, and I, you, you raise a good point, John. I don't know that Doug doesn't want that. Um, I don't know. But it there certainly seems in his three years here that he's much more into the whole committee type with at least one formidable back than having a guy who's actually a real Pro Bowl talent. Yeah, and that's because it's. It, I don't think he wants to be pigeonholed into using, uh, having to use the talents of a player like Le'Veon Bell, for instance. And I use him as the example for obvious reasons. Mm-hmm. Uh, then you have to change. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, Jeff, on uh, Mosher, McMullen, and Krause, and the fact that, look, midseason, too, you can't change the identity of your team offensively or defensively. So Doug is not going to change what he is, probably ever, but certainly not midseason. So I, I don't think they have ever, ever had any interest in bringing in a player like Bell uh, or or McCoy. Uh, would they have liked an upgrade? Yeah, uh, and and they would like a JHI type, and that's why. Well, maybe they thought know, Sproles was the upgrade. Well, possibly. Well, I mean, not, not possibly, probably. I, I hope you're uh, wrong. They were very excited that he was coming back. Anderson, the Panthers just cut uh, C.J. Anderson. I think the Eagles should think very hard about putting a waiver claim. I'm not sure they would get him. Uh, but just something, uh, some some proven commodity w- would help this offense dramatically. And if Darren Sproles was able to play last night, I think it would have had an impact. I really do. Well, if you're, if you were, you're right about this, Doug, not really wanting that kind of guy, uh, I, you know, I said a couple of weeks ago that I feared that the Eagles were someday down the road, a year or two, are going to become like the Packers, so over-reliant on the quarterback that they just forget about the running game from not just a coaching but a front office standpoint. But if what you're saying is true, they're there already. They are the Packers. Yeah, I, I, I mean, they, they probably are the Packers, but only because uh, of the injury. I, I think if Jay was here, I think if Darren was here, it, it's not that he wants to move completely away. 
He just doesn't want to have that superstar that takes him away from what he really wants to do, and that's play 11 personnel and spread the field. And and to his defense, and I, I say this constantly, that is the way to win consistently in the NFL today. It, it's to have more of the running back, and it's difficult to find, but if you can get a Kamara, if you can get even a Christian McCaffrey type, guys who can do both, those are the most difficult players to match up with uh, in the NFL. Uh, even the kid on the Patriots does the same thing. Uh, we saw him in the Super Bowl, his dominance. Nobody has a player that can deal uh, with a running back that's a dual threat. Um, it's akin to, uh, I believe it was you, John, who used to say Chip Kelly wouldn't want Tom Brady. No. <laughs> that's that's a fair point, except I think you do have to put the context in. Look, if 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 you're so hell-bent on your scheme in a case of Chip where he wants to run tempo and he doesn't want a, a Tom Brady or a Pete Manning type because they wouldn't fit what he wanted to do, I think that's worse than in a pass-driven league. Uh, you don't necessarily want to be run first because, as I said, you can win that way. And the Redskins have won a number of games that way. But the margin of error is so small, I, I don't think you can win consistently that way. Uh, at JF McMullen, follow him on Twitter. And, of course, uh, you can check out all his coverage of last night's loss to the Cowboys. Four and five, you've got the Saints, you've got the Rams still, you've got the Houston Texans still, plus a lot of division games. So um, where does last night's loss confidence-wise, put you? Well, it's a devastating loss. I mean, that's a bad football team, and you lose at home. And we haven't even gotten to the fact that they've lost three straight games at home. You think about how dominant. The reason they won the Super Bowl last year is because nobody could come into Lincoln Financial Field and do anything. And now they've lost three straight. So I, the confidence is shaken. I, I still... This did you sense that so in that bad, lock? Though. Did you sense that from them in the locker room? Oh yeah, I, I've never seen Carson Wentz more down. Uh, just his mannerism, um, the way he was speaking, uh, I, I've never seen him per, from a personal never level. I, I've never seen him uh, take a loss that badly. Uh, I think they know uh, they were beaten by an inferior team. And you look for ways to explain it. I mean, think about, and, and I tweeted this, think about in the 2018 NFL. One of, one of the spins of this Eagles team has been they keep shooting themselves in the foot. They played a clean game. They didn't have one penalty. <laughs> and they lost to the Dallas Cowboys at home. I, I, Meanwhile, Dallas is false starting on every third down. I mean, it's unbelievable they didn't want to win that game. Special teams penalty? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good point. Uh, it, it, it is unbelievable they lost that game. So I do think it shakes the confidence a little bit. On the other hand, you know, Washington deserves credit for taking care of business, but they played a really poor game. Yes, they if did. If anyone saw that game. Yeah, I was ugly. Uh, against a terrible team. I got a feeling both of those teams are going to hang around, the Cowboys and Redskins. So as bad as it looks today, as bad as that schedule looks, you might be able to win this division with nine wins, and it, and it might come down to week 17 in Washington. Hmm. Real quick, uh, there was an exchange last night with Wentz and Les Bowen, who seemingly was asking a question. I don't know that he did it the way he wanted to, but his point kind of was, hey, these first 15 scripted plays don't seem to be working. It seems that the other teams are on to you. And Wentz was like, good observation. Was that him kind of acknowledging that, yeah, they're not working. We need to, you know, we need to do something here. Uh, I don't think so. And this is interesting because uh, some people took it that way. And some people like me, when I heard it immediately, I thought he was just frustrated at less. Uh, well, other... he, I think he was frustrated because essentially less wasn't asking a question. He was making a statement. Yeah. Cause he said, and what's your question? Continued... And, and I think he got a little snarky. And because Carson never gets snarky, people, I think, some people took it literally. <laughs> I can just give you, from what I took, 
and I was at in the press conference, and I asked him, as I said about the Zach Ertz, for what I thought immediately was that he didn't like the way it was asked. Okay. Uh, and he was just trying to move on and, and sort of doing that, as I said, in a snarky fashion. Now, others, I talked to other reporters who took it the other way. So I, I did open my mind up from that point and say people could take it two different directions. Right. I find it hard to believe that Carson Wentz would criticize his coaching staff in public, even though maybe he should. I'm not saying that, but that's <laughs> also partially the reason I default to I think he was just being a little bit stop asking that question in that way gotcha. more than – well, it's, I, I will say this. Um, there were times last night that I'm watching Wentz, and it has the feeling sometimes that he cares more than the other guys. Like, he's trying to say, great job, great drive. And everyone else is like, ah, who cares, kid? You're too excited about this. We've already won a Super Bowl. Yeah, I, I, I don't, well, I think there's some of that. I talk about that all the time. I think that's subconscious. And I, I think that's what defines the New England Patriots' greatness, the fact that they're able – uh, to play at a high level year after year after year. There's there's a subconscious human, human nature thing to feel satiated after you win. But I, I don't see a lack of effort. That defensive yeah. line came out like a house on fire. <laughs> uh, look, when you have Chandon Sullivan and Trey Sullivan, and you're, you're down to players like that in the secondary, not to criticize them, but they, they haven't played before, um, they're not impactful players. It's not that they're not giving effort. It's just that they're not good enough. Yeah. Uh, John McMullen, more at 97.3ESPN.com. Thanks, John. Thanks, guys.